Our scripture lesson today comes from Luke, the 16th chapter, the first 13 verses of scripture. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summonsed him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you can, cannot be my manager any longer. When the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what I will do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people will welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred jugs of olive oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, you may welcome you into the eternal home. Whoever is faithful in, the, in very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with that which belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or he will devote it to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of God for the people of God. I was a little weak. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we're thankful for your love and your presence. We pray, dear God, that you might be with us and be our strength. May your Holy Spirit fill our hearts and give us, dear God, the understanding that we need to learn from your word. We are thankful for your great love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I said that was a little weak because you may have been wondering, now just exactly what did you say and how am I to be thankful for this praise of a dishonest steward, this dishonest manager who seemingly gets the okay from Jesus? Well, it is probably one of the most difficult stories in the New Testament to try to interpret because it really just doesn't fit into what we would think would be a normal approach to Christian living. Everyone being loving and above board and honest and open and totally transparent. Because in this story, we get the picture of a person who was shrewd and conniving and took advantage of a situation. And we're not quite certain how that fits into the Christian faith. John Wesley, before he was the founder of the Methodist Church, was a professor in Oxford. And when he started his position, he was paid 30 pounds a year. Now that doesn't sound like a lot of money in our day and age, but it was pretty good salary for an individual of that day. 30 pounds a year. Well, a few years later, he got a raise, and he started making 60 pounds. But what had happened was when he was making 30, he gave two pounds away, and he lived on 28. When he started making 60 pounds, he lived on 28 pounds and gave away 32. And throughout his ministry and throughout his life, John Wesley lived basically on that 28 pounds a year for the rest of his life. And everything else that he got in excess, he gave away. He invested in the kingdom. We talk a lot about raising the standard of living. 
and how we as individuals want upward mobility. And the more money we have, the better off we will be. But we make a tragic mistake because the more money we have doesn't necessarily mean that we will be better off. It simply means that we'll spend what we have. And we won't be doing the investing and being as shrewd as we should be. And you see, that's the miracle of the Methodist church. We look at our Methodist churches today, and let's be honest, we're upper middle class churches. We, we have wealth. We have facilities. We have programs. We have things that the average church just doesn't have because we have been blessed by God financially and monetarily and materially. We have all these things. But you know, we didn't when we started. When the Methodist church started, we were the poorest of the poor. We might have a few pennies in our pocket. People would look down upon us and not pay us any attention because we had no power or prestige. We had nothing to offer the world. We were simply people that were trying to survive. But the message of John Wesley was simply this, that when you turn your heart and your life over to God, your life changes, your priorities change. And guess what happens when you stop spending all your money on things that are worthless? When you stop spending all your money gambling? When you stop spending all your money on addictions? When you stop spending all your money just trying to impress your neighbor? you have more money. And when you have more money, you have more that you can do for the kingdom of God. You have more that you can invest and raise our standard of giving. And that was the secret of Methodism. It was what brought us to the place that we are today. Because years ago, when you get to church, do you remember hearing those sermons against wearing costly apparel and fine gold and all of the things that people used to get caught up in? Oh, I've heard sermon after sermon about don't waste your money on the things of the world. And that's true. When you buy a vehicle, do you buy it because of its utility? Or do you buy it because it will make you look good in the neighborhood when you drive through? You know? Advertisers know how to punch our buttons. They know how to get our money from us. And they take advantage of us all the time. And because they do, we go through life broke, trying to keep up with people that we don't even really know or probably don't even really like. And we're always behind. And it's because we've missed this basic principle of what God expects us to do. He expects us to be shrewd. He expects us to be wise. And so we as children of the light need to be as shrewd and as far-sighted as the people of the world. And that means we understand that the money that we have is a resource that we can use to build the kingdom. And yes, we take care of our needs. We take care of who we are and our, our families. But we also realize that just because you have a dollar in your pocket, you don't have to spend it. I remember one time Eric was a teenager and I gave him $20. He could not, he could not wait until he went to spend it. I mean, it was just like it was burning a hole in his pocket. He just could not spend and so he went and spent it on a worthless piece of whatever, I don't know. Well, I learned a lesson from that, and I hope that he did too. In other words, the money that we have, the resources that we have, the mind that we use, let's use it for the kingdom and not simply fall into the trap, because that's what happened. This story is about a manager that was working for an absentee farm owner. And because he was the manager, he was the one that got to make the deals. He was the one who set the price for what the wheat and the olive oil would sell for, and he made the deals. Now, it doesn't really say that he was actually a crook. It just simply says that charges were brought against him. Maybe someone didn't like him. You know, there are such a thing as false accusations. But the owner took them to heart and said, okay, there's going to be a, an inventory and an accounting, and you're going to lose your job. 
the manager sat down and quickly thought, now listen, I don't want to work and I have too much pride to beg, so what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to try to build goodwill with the people that can help me. And so he called them in one by one and said, what do they owe you? What do you owe? And he said, reduce the bill. If you owe 100 containers of oil, reduce it to 50. If you owe 100 bushels of wheat, reduce it to 80. And what did he do? He created goodwill among those people. Now, we don't know the rest of the story, but the idea is being that he created enough goodwill that they would take care of him later on. We like people who are shrewd, don't we? You know, I'm always three days late on a bargain or a deal. I mean, I'm never really right there. But there are people who can understand a good deal and make money hand over fist without any problem at all because they're thinking all the time. And during the financial crisis that we've had recently, I came to the realization that some of our financial people can actually create financial instruments that will make money that have no value whatsoever to them, but they create the image that you're actually making something until it all falls apart. Being a Christian is not a call to be dumb and ignorant and naive. Being a Christian, Jesus is saying to us, means that we need to be as shrewd as the world. And we need to realize that some things are important and some things aren't. We need to look at our value system again, just as John Wesley did for the early Methodist. During the past several months and weeks, I have become very aware of insurance, health insurance particularly. <laughs> Vicki's hospital bills are going to cost well over a million dollars. The helicopter ride from Paducah to Nashville was $49,000. Where have I got money like that? I mean, preachers make a good salary, but <laughs> we don't make that much. But thankfully, I have insurance. And insurance is stepping up and helping in ways that still astonish me. And it's not over with yet, but I'm hoping and praying that it's okay. Now, many of you have insurance, don't you? I hope you do. Do you know of anyone that doesn't have insurance? Do you know of anyone that is at the mercy of all of those big bills that might come? And I'm amazed that we as a society can't come up with a way to help people meet the most basic needs of health. And there's a lot of scheming and conniving and shrewdness going on right now. Well, what about eternal insurance? Do you ever think about that? Do you have that knowledge of your salvation? Do you have that assurance of God's presence in your life? Wesley preached a no-so salvation, that we could know that our sins were forgiven and that God loved us and that when we died, heaven would be our home. And because of that, there was that confidence and that ability to live life with a sense of joy and peace. If you've got insurance, you're not quite as worried about the medical issues that might come. And if you've got God in your heart and your life, you're not quite as worried about what might take place because you know that God is there. So we need to be as shrewd and far-sighted as the world. Secondly, we need to use our temporal treasures for eternal destinies. We need to realize that those things that we sometimes hold on to so hard and we think, oh, this is my life, this is who I am, those things will fade away. 
But what we have inside, our relationship with God, is the most important thing that we have. Understanding that what we do here, our church, our community, our mission efforts, our classes, all of those things are ways in which we can build ourselves. Are we taking advantage of all of those things? Or do we simply say, well, I joined that church years ago, and when I die, they'll give me a good funeral. We preachers have this joke about people who simply want to be married and buried. I mean, it's not much of a joke, to tell you the truth. It's sort of sad. But that's all they want. They want to be married and buried and sort of left alone in between. Well, let me share something with you. God is not going to leave you alone. And he is going to be challenging you and asking you to grow in your understanding and your shrewdness of the faith. Because what we do here is more than just our temporal security and more than just taking care of ourselves. It's building the future. It's understanding what God is doing for each and every one of us. There's a delightful story about a man who was sailing out in the ocean and he had a ship, his shipwreck, his, his boat went down and so he swam to a, what he thought was a deserted island. After he got himself secured and comfortable he realized it wasn't deserted. <laughs> that on the other side of the island there was a whole tribe of people and as it would happen when they saw him they thought he was God. And so they started worshiping him and doing anything that he wanted them to do. And he was eating that up. I mean, that's a pretty good life, isn't it? You know, you've got everything there. They take care of you. They provide for you. I mean, it's a good life. Well, about three or four months into his stay there, he discovered that his kingship was only temporary. Because at the end of a year, they were going to take him over to another island, and there they were going to leave him. And he'd have to make do on his own. That was their custom. That was their tradition. One year, and then you're out. Well, being a shrewd person... This man soon discovered that while he was still king, there was a few things that he could do because they still had to follow him and obey him. And so he started sending people over to the other island to clear the land and to build a house and to plant some crops and to dig the well and to do everything that needed to be done in order to make that new island inhabitable. And in fact, toward the end of his reign, he actually sent some of the people from the original island over to the new island so they'd be living there. And so when the day came where he was to be transported to that new island, his home was already built, his crops had already been planted, the well had already been dug, and people were already there to be his friends. Now hopefully you can make the transition between island and earth and heaven. What we do here is preparing ourselves for the future. And yes, that's why we try to be kind. That's why we try to be gentle. That's why we try to be long-suffering. That's why we try to forgive that's why we try to take care of the little things because that's what God has given us. He's given us the little things and if we can show God's grace in those little things, how much better, how much more, how much greater will our reward be in the life to come. It's a hard, hard story but it's a story we need to hear as Christian people. Jesus is saying, don't be afraid, don't be scared, don't be intimidated, take some action, do something, get involved. 
Be shrewd. Be proactive in your faith, in your commitment to God. How shrewd are you today in your salvation? In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.